Don't put that in, Rick. Okay. Do you put whispers in? If someone tells you not to. Don't put that in. Don't put that in, Rick. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have Dr. Christina Rossetti on the show. Back in March, she hosted the Juanita Brooks Conference at Utah Tech University. It was a wonderful conference, and so we're going to talk first a little bit about Juanita Brooks and the Mountain Meadows Massacre. We'll also talk about Christina's journey um, through religious studies. It turns out it involves a couple of conversions and a faith crisis. And uh, so it's funny that a Catholic person is so involved in Mormon studies. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have my first, I'm going to call you a Catholic Mormon scholar on. Let's do it. Yeah. So tell us who you are and where we are. Uh, I'm Christina Rossetti, and we are in sunny St. George, Utah. Yes, very nice. Uh, I, I was in Florida a couple months ago. Uh, St. George in March is, is really nice. So It's supposed it, to be. Yeah. It's kind of cold. but It was a little colder than, than St. George is normally, but yeah, it was still, still good weather. So what did we do this weekend? What did you organize this weekend? Uh, well, me and I guess... Joseph Stewart at BYU and I organized a conference in honor of the legacy of Juanita Brooks. And mm. Rick very kindly came down for it. Yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So it's the first, is it going to be an annual event? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of people want it to be. And we had a really good turnout. The hope is that it can continue. Um, we'll see. I'm going to talk to... Uh, Utah Tech is where I work, and it um, helped really host it. And so it's kind of up to them. We're going to be sending out surveys. So oh, you are. To fill one out. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> um, and so we're going to, I mean, hopefully. We had a really good turnout for a very first-time conference. I mean, getting 110 people to Mountain Meadow, the Mountain, Meadow, Mountain, Meadow, Mountain Meadows Massacre site and also, like, getting 110 people to, like, day through a whole day of conference talks. That's, I feel like people clearly want it to be here. <laughs> so I was shocked when Joey and I planned it. I said, I just want 40 people to show up. Oh, wow. So I was really, I was really pleased. And it, it was really great to have so many friends from Northern Utah and beyond come. So, so you grateful. counted it was 110 that, that actually traveled to the Mountain Meadows Massacre sites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We had a hundred and well, 109. Okay. At all the sites. We had 110 on Friday and we had about 50 watching online. Okay. And then the stream at this point has been watched about um, 260 something times. So okay. And Very we had 188. Good. You'll have to send now. me that link and I'll, I'll let people yeah, that'd be great. watch it again. Um, so. Just because it is, I mean, some of the speakers were, I mean, all the speakers were great, but. Yeah. Who were the headliners? Uh, well, the keynote was Elder Stephen E. Snow. Right. Um, Emeritus Church historian and recorder. Um, for former those. Gospel Tangents guest, I will add. Former Gospel Tangents guest. He also did the Saints series, which I think is how most people probably... Right. Or how most people probably would remember his legacy. Um, he also did the Gospel Topics essays. Right. He was the church historian behind that. Um, and then we had... I mean, we had so many incredible people. We had Amanda Amanda Hendricks Komodo. We had, we had Richard Turley. Um, he did the tour of Mountain Meadows and spoke on it with Barbara um, Jones Brown. Um, we had we had Paul Reeve. I mean, we had so many people. Greg was, Prince. Greg Prince was also I, yeah. Greg Prince was the first speaker right. of the day. Um, spoke on Lester Bush. We also honored Lester Bush uh, with an award. Um, we were really grateful that his wife was able to come out and accept it on his behalf. Um, she didn't know that it was happening. So <laughs> I thought she knew that she, um, he, she, that Lester was being honored, but. Well, I talked to Greg while we were up at Mountain Meadows and I was like, how did you make that a surprise? He goes, well, I just told her I was speaking. I didn't tell her about the award. <laughs> yeah, he organized her being there. And so I could only have assumed that she would know why she was in St. George. She was just listening to Greg. <laughs> <laughs> it was like such, I don't know. <laughs> but she, I mean, if for an award honoring Juanita Brooks, there really isn't someone better yeah. to give than uh, to Lester Bush and for all the work he did. So it was, but it was a great, 
conference and um it was i mean yeah it was so great to be able to go out to the mountain meadows massacre site and have so many community members of saint george hear about the, the history from i mean if you're gonna the hear, best if you're gonna hear the history of the mountain meadows massacre there is no one else yeah. in the world the only person who would have been who was missed probably was Will Bagley, but he passed away right. a year ago. I don't remember how long right. ago. It's been a while. But. Uh, and Janice Johnson, she was there and she spoke and she has a new book coming out um, called Convicting the Mormons, which yeah. is about um, kind of how Mor Mountain Meadows Massacre was weaponized against Mormons in the media and against um, to kind of make them seem not American. Um, so she was also there talking about it. Yeah, I mean, it was, I was really happy with how it turned out and I was so grateful to see so many friends and, yeah, yeah, so great. So I got to ask you, Rossetti, that sounds like a very Italian name. Am I right on that? Uh, yeah, it is Italian um, by way of Argentina. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not from Argentina, but my dad was born there and um, lived his childhood in Argentina before coming here. But you're not like an Italian Catholic. You're, you're Catholic, but you didn't like grow up in the faith. No. So we got to talk a little bit about that. My dad did, though. Okay. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't talk a lot about my Catholicism. Um, <laughs> We're going to talk about it today. Uh, what a time! I need. To, I've, I've had. A, I've had a Pentecostal scholar, a Lutheran scholar, Anglican, um, but you're my first Catholic. And and oh, I did talk to Patrick Mason. He went to Notre Dame. Went but, to Notre Dame. But I don't know. I don't know if you saw that. Did he get anything wrong? Or you didn't see the interview? Probably. I didn't. Yeah. But I mean, I would be shocked if Patrick Mason got something wrong. <laughs> be shocked uh but yeah he went yeah he went to notre dame which is it's so interesting that notre dame became such a prominent school in the united states that people forget that it actually is like still a catholic school like you have to take theology classes if you if you're there yeah but it's not like byu no that's what patrick said no it's not but it is like it it's one of the yeah it's not because there are catholic schools that are so you can be a non-catholic and take like protestant classes at notre dame Yes. You can't do that at BYU, though. <laughs> no. There are, but there are Catholic schools that are like BYU. So if you okay. go to like Sacred Heart College or Aquinas College, you know, or one of like Georgetown. the smaller. George, Georgetown no. still feels like similar to Notre Dame, but there are like small ones that are like Immaculate Heart College that I'm sure is a little more Catholic uh -huh. <laughs> than Notre Dame. But uh, yeah, he did. I think we've talked about that a little bit, you know, him and I, but... Uh, yeah, I never went to Catholic school or college because I was not Catholic until very recently. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so you were Pentecostal sort of, right? Before I you was. became Catholic? Yeah, I wasn't raised that either, though. <laughs> My just <laughs> multiple conversions. Um, yeah, I was I was raised um, generically Christian, like so many people in the United okay. States. Um, my dad was Catholic, but um, is... Now, I think he would identify as agnostic. Um, and my mom is Christian but doesn't go to church. Um, and so I went to Episcopalian school. Oh, really? I did. My See, that's very Catholic, though, isn't it? Or is it? I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I think what's interesting about um, Episcopalian schools is they can go one of two ways. There are Episcopalian schools that are connected to Episcopalian churches, which have a lot of um, edu like religious formation and religious education attached to them. Mine wasn't that at all. So I left um, preschool through eighth grade Episcopalian school, and I've, I had no idea what an Episcopalian was, which was very funny because now my boyfriend is an Anglican, a priest in the Anglican Church of Canada. So now I really know what an Episcopalian is. Oh. Um, but I had no idea. Is there like tension between Episcopalians and Anglicans? Because they're like the same thing, kind of. So the there's a bunch of... It's a complicated story. <laughs> That's what we're all about. Uh, so the Anglican Church of North America is not the same thing as the Episcop as the Episcopalian the Episcopal Church. The Anglican Church of Canada is in communion with the Episcopal Church. It is not in communion with the Anglican Church of North America. Oh, now that's really confusing. Yeah. Um, and the Anglican Church of Canada and the Episcopal Church are in communion with the Church of England. But the Anglican Church of North America is in communion with GAFCON, which are the the Anglicans of the Global South, or represent many Anglicans in the Global South. So there's it's a complicated story <laughs> of who people are in communion with. But 
All that to say, I didn't really know. Now, see, I told you, I know too much about it now because my boyfriend is a priest in this religion. Oh, you can't know too much about anything. So, but yeah, all that to say, I, I left eighth grade um, really not knowing what an Episcopalian was, even though I had just gone to chapel every day, every Monday for most of my life. And you just like blew off everything or they didn't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't, I didn't go through Christian formation in any way. Um, again, like my mom was Christian and always talked about it. And so I knew that she was Christian. And so I kind of was like, well, I guess I am too, but I never really thought about it. Um, it wasn't part of my life at all. And then I went to high school and I went to high school in Southern California and my best friend got saved. Uh -huh. um, born again. She got born again. And she invited me to church. And a lot of people did in my high school and like the surrounding area. So Southern California? Yeah. So I was in Southern California. I went to Aliso Niguel High School. And a lot of people started going to this very to two churches that were really prominent. And it's interesting because one was Reformed. Um, so it was very Calvinist. It was called Compass Bible Church. And then a lot of people started going to... Calvinist is once saved, always saved? Calvinism is predestination. Is total, oh, predestination. Total okay. depravity. Unlimited, no, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Okay. So predestination. But on the other end, a lot of people started going um, to Living Hope Christian Fellowship, which is where my best friend got, at the time, got saved. And she's a born again. She's born church. again. And she invited me to church, to youth group, which I had no interest in going to, but I went. Um, <laughs> yeah, she was like, we'll get McDonald's. And I was like, great. Um, See, this is weird because you're like a religious studies scholar and you sound like you're so uninterested in I was really in high school. I was really uninterested in high school. It wasn't wow. up until this moment. Um, and we went to youth group. It was called Altered Youth, but it was a play on words. It was altered like an altar, like yeah. an altar call, um, which is funny because most non-denominational churches or evangelical Pentecostal churches don't have altars anymore. So... I went to youth group and I really liked it. Everyone was really nice. I kept going back. Um, it was part of the International Church of the Four Square Gospel, which is a pretty small Pentecostal church. And I had a, you know, a salvation experience, a born again experience where um, I thought I, well, at the, it's complicated how you look back on like, you know, moments like that. But I believed that I had been healed of something that had um, been diff a physical problem for quite a while. And I decided that I was going to get saved. So I went to my youth pastor, who became my youth pastor pretty soon after, and we did the prayer. And then I was baptized. The sinner's prayer? The sinner's prayer. He did it with me. And then I was baptized in the ocean at North Beach in wow. San Clemente. Um, my parents came. They were my parents have always been incredibly supportive of my religious journeys. Meandering. <laughs> uh, they've always been incredibly supportive. Um, but I was baptized in the ocean. It was very cold. Yeah. Um, Southern in, California water is very cold. If you want warm water, go to Florida. <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean is warmer than the Pacific, is what people tell me. Yeah. Um but yeah, I was baptized in the ocean and I was Pentecostal and I I was very... Did you speak in tongues? Well, Rick, this is why I'm not Pentecostal anymore. <laughs> Welcome to my faith crisis. We're just going <laughs> to <laughs> jump ahead. <laughs> um, I want you to know I yeah. attended the Bicker Tonight Church with Steve okay. Pinecker in Florida. Yeah. And they're very Pentecostal. They, it's yeah. called the Church of Jesus Christ. And they sometimes speak in tongues. Yeah. I was so disappointed they didn't do it while I was there. Yeah, I... Uh, a lot of people did around me. That was, it was a very um, common part of my Christian experience, seeing people speaking in tongues. Um, for those who don't know, the International Church of the Four Square Gospel was founded by Sister Amy Semple McPherson um, in the 1920s, first woman on the radio. Oh, wow. Um, and in LA, she built this building called Angela's Temple. And she was rad. I wanted to be her. <laughs> I she was She was so incredible. Um, I mean, she had a very complicated life. She ended up, you know, at some point staging her own kidnapping to collect the ransom. And really? Ends up having multiple affairs, dies of a drug overdose. Um, and oh, But wow. I didn't know that when I was Pentecostal. Like, I didn't know that. I bet they don't that. emphasize that very much. 
They don't. That would be anti four square gospel or anti Pentecostal. <laughs> That's anti four square material. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no one talks about that. Um, I learned that later, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> but she was. I mean, she oh, was. We got some scandals in some somebody besides Joseph Smith. This is she, great. We might have to. Was, we might have to have a second interview about this. She was beautiful, though. She was charismatic. She, I mean, like she was beautiful, and she was. She did these big productions. People gravitated toward her. Um, but the four squares are Jesus as Savior, Baptizer, Healer, and King. And by Baptizer, it doesn't just mean in water; it also means in the Holy Ghost. And so because of that, a lot of people speak in tongues. And that's where you get the four square, huh? Yes. And I remember going to the four square convention in Anaheim, in like the Anaheim Convention Center. And I remember this distinct moment where like the lights dim and then like the stage lights come up and everyone said, we are four square and put their hands up like this. And I was like, oh, I don't wow. know. And I was like, I don't know if I'm this actually. <laughs> like <laughs> we didn't do this at church. Um, but yeah, so everyone, a lot of people spoke in tongues. Um, a lot of there was a lot of healing. And it didn't freak you out or anything. Um, I thought it was different. I mean, that I was I went to Episcopalian school, and that didn't do that for sure. And my mom's Christian, and she doesn't. Well, Episcopalians do are pretty. It was different, but for I mean, it never seemed weird to yeah. me. It was just kind of like, huh. Um, I thought the deliverance ministries were a little strange. Um, at the time which was like when you like cast demons out of people, um, that was kind of a little like, oh. The exorcist. Um, which like, but like now I'm Catholic and like we have exorcists, but it's like different, I guess, when, because huh. everything, I don't know. I just remember a lot of things connected to like demonic spirits. And so like I had a spirit of um, insomnia cast out of me once. Oh, wow. I like had a hard time sleeping one week. I don't know. So. Did it work? I mean, I never had chronic insomnia. This was like, oh, the woman who did it um, just sensed that I had this. Oh. For so. the last like seven years, and I don't know, I think it's just because I'm getting old. Like I have a hard time sleeping through the night anymore. I usually, usually I get up, I go to the bathroom or whatever, and then I go yeah. back to sleep and I'm good. But I, I just, it, it drug, bugs me because I used to sleep, you know, eight, nine, ten hours Straight, it was fine. Well, deliverance ministries are available. Okay. <laughs> Apparently. I mean, it happened to me. Um, but I I was really invested in being Pentecostal, in being Foursquare. And I wanted to go on a mission. And I looked at the forms. And, you know, the forms to go on a Foursquare mission, you have to put the date of your water baptism and the date of your baptism in the Holy Spirit. And oh, I... And they're not the same date? Well, no, your baptism in the Holy Spirit is the day you start speaking in tongues. Oh, that's interesting. And I didn't have that. And in the Foursquare Church used to be, be very kind of in the camp of, are you saved if you don't speak in tongues? It's no longer like that anymore for the most part, but it really used to focus on that speaking in tongues is a sign of your salvation. And that's really hard <laughs> when you're deeply invested in this religion, but you don't have the outward sign that you are saved. And so that was really hard for me. Um, and I went to college camp. This is like right before I peaced out. Um, I went to college camp and if people have seen the movie like Jesus camp, um, it was very much my camp experience hmm. where it's heightened emotion. It's really intense. It's really intense. And it's kind of modeled after there's a day where you get saved and then there's a day where people just pray over you to receive the gift of tongues. And I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't do it. And I ser and people definitely, I knew that people lied and pretended to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Um, but that didn't feel like it, the whole thing. It was really difficult. It was really difficult. And ultimately um, that eventually led me to no longer being Pentecostal. Oh. I became non-denominational for a while. Um, but it was like my slow journey out is just being like, if this is required for me to be saved, like, and I'm clearly I'm not. So why am I sticking around? Mm. That sounds like, you know, sounds like some other podcast I'm not going to mention. <laughs> we don't usually go here, there, but this is cool. So uh, we have an upswing coming, though. <laughs> OK, we continue on. Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, I've become non-denominational that I don't know. Over time, I just kind of stopped believing. It's one of those things that like when you stop believing part of it, 
how do you stick around for just part? I had a really hard time doing that. Um, and so I just kind of stopped going to church, um, became increasingly agnostic about things. Um, I started, I went to undergrad. Still believed in Jesus though, right? Or Yeah, I did. Um, I did. I think it's hard because in hindsight, I probably was in a, I eventually, when I start, well, by the time I started grad school, I was in a camp where I was probably leaning toward atheism, but even now I feel really uncomfortable using the word atheist. Hmm. Um, and so I, I, I say that I was really agnostic at that, by that time. Um, but kind of a hopeful atheist, probably. I, yeah. I just, for some reason, atheism still feels a little too strong for what I was. Um, and in reality, like I wasn't certain there wasn't a God. I was just, I w was very agnostic. I didn't, I was just very like, I don't know what's going right. on. Um, so I started grad school, um, but because of everything, because of Pentecostalism, because of, because of everything, I was like, religion is interesting to me. I, I want to know why people become religious, why people stay religious. Um, because of the religions that I was so interested in, the 19th century was something that I was fascinated by. And so when I started, when I went to grad school, I signed on to study religion because this was something that was just deeply interesting to me on a personal level, but also sociologically it was so interesting. Um, and yeah, so I was an agno agnostic person who started okay, so religious sure. studies. So it sounds like high school you were kind of converted to Pentecostal, born again kind of a thing. And then you got to college and then you weren't able to speak in tongues and kind of had a faith crisis. Is that? Yeah. Okay. And then where did you go to college? Um, I went to Cal State. Oh, I went to Saddleback Community College first because um, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Saddleback? That sounds like in Arizona. No, it's in California. Okay. Um, we were the gauchos though. Oh. But I went to community college because I didn't know what to do and I... Um, community. I used to work at Salt Lake Community College. It's a great place to start. I, it really is. If, I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to yeah. do, and I didn't want to spend the money on just wafting around not knowing what I was going to do. And so I highly recommend community college. Like there's, I think there still is sometimes some kind of shame about doing that route. It's not shameful and at all. No. It's smart because you I, save money. <laughs> I highly, I highly, highly recommend it. It is such a path for so many people yeah. and it makes education accessible. I could go on forever. I yeah. highly, I'm a huge supporter of community college. Well, I was teaching at Salt Lake Community College and Utah Valley University at the same time. Okay. And it was like, I, I didn't have to do anything different because, I mean, they were different books, but it was the same information. I'm like, yeah. this is not any different than regular college. Right. I mean, if, if you take a math class, yeah. it's going to be a math class. <laughs> and I mean, exactly. I mean, the, the cost was so much cheaper. Right. And I, and I ended up being, I just, I would not, I was not prepared to enter a four year college or university after high school. I was just absolutely unprepared. Well, and I will tell you, uh, I'll, sh I'll throw out another community college success story. Todd Compton. Yeah. <laughs> he went to snow college. I mean, my daughter goes there. I, it, there's no reason not to. Right. It's, it, yeah, it's such a pathway for success for so many people. Yeah. Um, and for, I mean, I also wasn't good at school. I didn't, I did really poorly in math and science. And mm. so I just was not prepared to go to a four-year college at all. Um, and then when I did, I transferred to Cal State Fullerton, which is a state school in California. We have two systems, the UC system and the Cal State system. Um, and so I went to Cal State Fullerton. Is one more prestigious than the other? The UCs are. Um, you got UC Berkeley, right? Yeah, the right, UC like system is, but it's really because... I mean, there. California has this like pro, this plan for education, um, and the idea was that the UCs were going to be professional degrees, and that's where you go to become a lawyer, a doctor, get a PhD, all of that. And the Cal State system um, really was geared more toward um, doing like they have really so, really solid education programs like a lot of teachers go to the Cal like a lot of elementary middle school teachers high school teachers go through the Cal State system okay um so they were kind of designed to do different things um but but they probably overlap quite a bit now now they do yeah. um, but that was like it yeah. still is the case that the Cal States don't have a lot of PhD programs they have some but not mm -hmm. a whole lot um so I really loved Cal State Fullerton. I'm trying to remember Fullerton. Are they the Titans? The Titans. I was right. Okay, good. Yep. And our mascot's an elephant. Yep. Um, but my dad went back to, when I was in high, 
in middle school, my dad really generously, I couldn't do my math homework. And my dad went back to school to be able to help me. (laughs) Yeah. Which was so kind of him. Um, and I'm so grateful for that, even though like, you know, do kids listen to their parents? Unfortunately for me, no. Um, (laughs) but he went to Cal State Fullerton and he became a really, uh, he became, he, L- See, if I would have taught you, you'd have been fine. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I was stubborn. Still have it. <laughs> but he, I mean, he, yeah, he's a brilliant, he's brilliant at math. Um, and so I went to Cal State Fullerton because my dad was there. Like, well, yeah, yeah, I don't well, know yeah. anything about college. Yeah. What is college? Um, but I fell in love with school the minute I found like something I liked. And so I decided. Which was, what was your major? I was liberal studies, which is humanities, general okay. humanities. Um, my concentration ended up being religion by the end. And because you kind of have in your faith crisis at this time, and, and I'm like, then like, why do people like religion anyway? Yep. I actually wrote my capstone project on Amy Semple McPherson. And she is the founder of the Four Square Church. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know where that capstone is, but I did that. <laughs> and <laughs> as I was working on that, my advisor, um, who became a really good friend of mine, he was like, maybe you should go to grad school. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> like, I don't know. My grad school application experience was a nightmare. Um, but by the, by luck of a draw and the grace of God, I got into grad school and I, where I, I went to university of California, Riverside. Okay. Um, UC Riverside was, do was, they have any sports teams? We have well, supposedly our baseball team is good. We okay. are the, um, what is our mascot? It's a bear. All the Cal States are a bear. All, all the UCs are a bear. Yeah. But like UCLA is the Bruins. We're not the Bruins. Yeah. What Golden Bears. You're not the Cal Golden Bears. Clearly I'm a huge sports fan. The Black Bears. Who knows? Okay. Clearly I love sports. Um, yeah, no. So I went to UC Riverside. Um, it was close to home. I got to see my family still all the time. Um, I was only 23 when I started my PhD program. So I was at, at UC Riverside. Oh, so, oh. I didn't do a master's. So I thought you went to Claremont. No, I taught there. Oh, you taught at Claremont. For a minute. Okay. Yeah. I did a VAP there after I graduated. Okay. Um, yeah, so I went to UC Riverside and I was really interested in the 19th century. Um, and I, for many reasons, I was really interested in the communitarian aspect of a lot of the religions that emerged in the 19th century. I was real. I mean, the revivals, the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening as someone who was Pentecostal once. I read about the Second Great Awakening and I'm like, this has been going on for a long time (laughs) about people just having these ecstatic experiences. Um, That was just so interesting to me. The shouting Methodists, were you into them? I was into, and like the itinerant preachers and the camp meetings. I mean, yeah, all of that was just so, Charles Finney, it was just so interesting. But then there was all these other new religions that were emerging at the time. One of them, you might be familiar with. Maybe. It's called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> also known as? The Mormons. Yeah, you can say that I'm word on this show. It's, oh. it's okay. But I, I, yeah, I was just so interested in all of this. And I, I did an independent study with the professor who became my advisor later on. And she, again, just by luck of a draw, the grace of God, assigned me a book called Rough Stone Rolling. Oh. And... It was part of an independent study, so I read a bunch of different books on different traditions. Um, she's not a scholar of. See, I keep waiting Mormonism. for. Well, and then I knew this Mormon, and uh, that doesn't I'm, sound like it was in part of your no story. No, all. I. She assigned me rough stone rolling, and part of the weird situation of that is, I went home to see my family because um, I was doing that still really frequently, and I brought this book with me that I got from the library, rough stone rolling, and. I needed to finish it. And so I. That's a long look. (laughs) Well, Rick, let me tell you the story. I sit. So my fam, my kitchen table from my childhood home, I like sit down at like six o'clock in the morning on Saturday and I open it. And all of a sudden it's like four in the morning the next day. Oh my goodness. And I was just like, this is. Just like Parley P. Pratt. Well, I was like, this is what I'm, this is what I'm going to study the rest of my life. Wow. Like this is the most interesting so story. So it was like your Pentecostal conversion story. Yeah, this is your Mormon conversion I, story. I, 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 th- it was the most interesting story I had ever heard in my life. Wow. The story of Joseph Smith. I was completely captivated by the story of Joseph Smith, by the story of the restoration. The whole, it was just some, it was like nothing I'd ever read before. But 
And I mean, it kind of was in that it was very similar to other ones, but the difference is that like most people talk about is that Mormonism survived into the present right? in a way that the Shakers didn't. Right. Most people will go their whole life never meeting a Quaker, um, even though they, of course, continue to exist. Richard Nixon was a Quaker. Richard Nixon. But like, I don't know. Do you know a Quaker personally? No, I don't. Same. But I know a lot of Mormons personally. Um, in hindsight, I did know two Mormons in high school. Um one of them was like on the surf team, you know, um, but like I didn't really know what I had no idea right. what they were. Uh, my parents. Well, in high school, you weren't really no. interested and until I, you had this. Uh, but then I was like Pentecostal and like my parents would go out, would come out to Utah some winters to ski. Oh. And so, but like didn't really talk to anyone about religion. <laughs> you don't like just you like. You didn't go to Temple Square. No didn't at all like it wasn't we knew it existed i guess but it was just whatever and my we're here to ski yeah we're here to ski and like my parents both worked in real estate um in southern california in a city called irvine um and there's a temple that was built there the Newport Beach i temple. think right you see irvine and Aders? <laughs> sorry i'm a sports nut i can't help it rick knows every single <laughs> uct a sp- a spokesperson for the UC system. <laughs> it's all of college. It doesn't. I don't restrict myself to just California. UCLA and Berkeley are the big ones, though. <laughs> the only fo- the only college football game I've ever been to was UCLA versus University of Utah, and oh. I wore a University of Utah shirt because I was a fellow there. So I felt like oh yeah, I well, had to do it. You. I'm glad you did. I had to, and the and the U won. Of course, <laughs> that's not a surprise. <laughs> I mean, but UCLA. UCLA is not. They haven't been good since the seventies. Terry Donahue they was last good coach. Haven't been good since the seventies, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything. I don't know anything about sports <laughs> <laughs> at all. Terry Donahue was the last good coach they had. Or yeah, you know, I'm getting him mixed up with John oh Robinson, but he was USC. <laughs> Those are not the same. Ask anyone in California. Oh, I know. It'd be, yeah, UCLA, UCLA, USC is is as bad, if not worse, than BYU Utah. Oh yeah, I would say it's. I mean, it's at least. It feels probably more long stand. No, it's probably. Oh, it's more way long. more long standing. Okay. Yeah. Well. I don't know when BYU gets a football. BYU team. was crappy until Lavelle Edwards in the seventies, and then they then they seventies the was a high point of college sports. It seems. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was when UCLA was good, uh, <laughs> and then you know then. We got Ron Meyer and, and or Urban Meyer, excuse me, Ron Meyer, somebody else, Urban Meyer, and then it's you know we we we, we dominate BYU again, so it's nice. But they have well, won the Utes. last couple of years, but you know. Shout out to the Utes. Yeah. What's their like? Isn't it like that? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Go Utes. <laughs> and this is Weber, by the way. And this is um, <laughs> Utah Tech. Go Trailblazers. Oh, it is. I didn't know that. Yeah. Now Utah Tech used to have another name. It did. Can you say it? It was Dixie State. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was Dixie College, and then it was Dixie Academy before that. Um, yeah. Mm, Dixie State Patrick. College, and they, they were the look- Rebels, and then they were the... Yeah. Blazers? We're Didn't the they, Trailblazers now. Wasn't there something in between Blazers and Rebels? Like, I've worked here for five months. Okay. Oh, is that all? <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't realize that. I thought it was longer than that. I no, guess I've known you longer than that. Oh yeah, I mean you've known me since grad since I was in grad school. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, we're the we're the Trailblazers. Um, I don't. How's our football team? I have no idea. They suck. <laughs> I don't pay attention to them. I mean, my students are watching. I'm sorry, especially my football players. Out They're not D one, are they? Maybe they are. I don't know. I don't you know wouldn't that, know. I don't know what that means. But uh, uh, I will tell you this. Here's our connection with Utah Tech. Utah Valley University used to be known as Utah Tech. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't. Yeah, back in the 80s. Like, I remember when they were Utah Tech. Whoa. And then they became Utah Valley State College and then Utah Valley University. And then you stole our name. <laughs> Me, per- I personally did. That's right. <laughs> I just remember getting um, a note at, I think it was an email, letting new faculty know that we're not supposed to say UTU. Oh, really? Why not? We're just UT. It's part of the branding guy. That's University of Texas. Actually, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I. I yeah, like UT Austin. Like, yeah, it's, that's not Utah Tech Austin. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're. I was told very clearly, don't say UTU. 
Oh, that's interesting. Because I remember having to re- erase, delete the last U from my syllabi. Oh, that's funny. This spring. Yeah. So, yeah. No. That was actually pretty controversial now, down here to change the name, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I, fo- I mean, I followed the controversy because like Nancy Ross, um, who some people might know, she works she at... She was a former guest. Former here guest. I mean, she's incredible. She's been there. She's been at Utah Tech for 16 years. Wow. Yeah, I introduced her to And she's something. a Community of Christ pastor, if I believe. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, she was ordained a few years ago. Yeah. Hi, Nancy. Um, but yeah, she, I followed her especially in it because she would, t- she talked quite a bit about it on social media, on Twitter. About the name change. Yeah. And so I, I followed her talking about that and um, I saw a few Salt Lake Tribune, Desert News articles, and then it felt like a really obvious choice to change the name. <laughs> Well, they were the Washington Redskins for a long time until now they're finally the Commanders. So, yes. you know, some, some things die hard. Yeah. It, but now if you go to Utah Tech, it says Utah Tech University, Dixie Campus. Oh, it does? It still says that. Oh, that's weird. I didn't know that. I don't know if that was like a concession. It sounds like it. It feels Yeah, it feels like it. But yeah, it does say that still. So... Hmm. I don't know, but it's a, it's a good school. Wow, wow. Our football team apparently is bad, according to Rick Bennett. <laughs> I don't think they're D1. I think they're like 1AA. They don't say 1AA. It's, they're FCS, not FBS. FBS is where all the good teams are. We have a great stadium. Okay. And a really we have a really good dance team. Okay. Yeah, one of my students is on the dance team. And our dance team like won nationals. Like Our dance team is great. Very good. I don't. I don't really. Even though my daughter's on the dance team at Snow, I don't really follow it other than Snow. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Christina Rossetti. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about how she got into Mormon studies. Uh, I was interested in Mormonism. Talked to my advisor, and she was like, "Have you met Mormons?" And I was like, "Well, hmm. here we go." Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> so I actually I walked across the street to Institute. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. It was the first, my first encounter with the LDS Church. And I asked the institute director if I could go to institute. Were you Catholic at this time? I was not. You were still agnostic face. I was still agnostic, but I was like, can I go to institute? And he was so kind. We're friends on Facebook. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah, he was great. He would have been like, golden investigator here. I know, I know. Um, but I signed up, and... Um, The institute that I went to was interesting in that there wasn't very many LDS people. There was only three. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, you can hear the audio only at patreon.com slash gospel tangents. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview with no interruptions. If you want to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can also sign up at Patreon or on youtube.com slash gospel tangents. And just subscribe here. You can watch the entire video uncut before everybody else. Also, if you'd like to continue to support Gospel Tangents, you can either sign up for our $10 or $20 memberships, or you can get some cool gear like this hat. Um, I've got the coffee mugs like this here. Uh, We've got sweatshirts and t-shirts, and I'm even thinking about ties. Somebody said they wanted a tie, so I'll see if I can get that on my store. So go to gospeltangents.com store, and you can get some Gospel Tangents gear. So you don't want to miss that. So anyway, thanks for listening. If you'd like to check out some of our other videos, check out here.